a generation, a voice arrives in the affairs of man that speaks the hopes and the desires of all mankind. And tonight we have such a voice. Gee, that was great. I don't think Ed McMahon could have done any better than that, do you? Oh, all right, okay, okay. You know one of the great things about about a holiday in the media, and uh, this is, let's face it, whether we like to admit it or not, this is media. Well, don't just nod. It is. God's sakes, you know, you can be smart all you want, but it is media. And before we go any further, what is the most important part of media today? Right. Good movies, bad movies. There's lots of both kinds around. I'm Walter Spencer. I see them all, and I try to let you know which ones are worthwhile and which ones to avoid. When John Gambling and I talk about new movies every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning at 9.20 a.m. Saturdays at the same time, we review what's up for the weekend at the neighborhood and suburban theaters. That's on Rambling with Gambling, right here on WOR. Until our next movie review, as they used to say in those great old Warner Brothers cartoons, that's all, folks. Now, that, that gets us back in the mood. And uh, since this is uh, Labor's, Labor Day, I mean, what kind of a mood is Labor Day? Well, M- Labor Day, to me, is a depressing holiday. I don't know how it is to you. I mean, first of all, it means... I think basically all of us feel depressed at Labor Day. I mean, the idea of having three days off is great, but it's quite obvious nobody has three days off in the media. No way. I mean, uh, radio goes, television goes, whether people are watching or listening or not. <laughs> but uh, one thing about Labor Day, this is one of those rare holidays. I would say the only other holiday that comes close to it in its curious, depressive quality is the Christmas New Year syndrome. Why? Well, they are, let's say, demarcation points. It's like if you can imagine the year is as a... How do you imagine the year, you personally? Do you, do you imagine it as a circle that's marked off in little segments? June, July, you know, little, little segments around it. You're running around this track. <laughs> do you see it that way? Or do you see it as a straight line, like a, like a ruler? Well, what happens when you get to the end of the ruler? It's all over? Well, that's only a year, right? I mean... Uh, I mean, what happens? You, 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 you turn around and start back down the ruler? Is that what you see? You see it as a straight thing, huh? Now, this is a very difficult abstract concept we're bringing out here because we're talking about how you visualize something that's non-visualable, really. It's time, see? But yet you do in your own mind. You see, you see the year a certain way. And uh, do you see it that way? Well, a lot of people, they found that most people, now you may not follow this, You may not see uh, it this way, but most people see the year as a kind of oval. That's right. Because, well, the reason I say this, and the reason this has been found to be true, and I'm not not just, this is not my opinion. This happens to be uh, a thing that was, uh, there were a lot of papers written on this in, in clinical psychology, people's concept of time, that if you see the world as an oval, it's, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you see, summer coming up again. Now, we're finishing summer here, but you're conscious of the fact that there is another summer in the future, right? It's, it's, it's theoretically, you're going to make it. At least you hope you'll make this next summer. Well, that's right. All of us suffer that same indecision about whether we'll ever actually make next week. We don't know, or even tonight. But the facts of the matter are that, uh, that you see this summer ahead of you, and you also see winter ahead of you. But now, now winter... In most people's minds, is much longer than summer. Summer goes by almost before you even know it's here. Do you agree? And yet, it's it's a good chunk of the year. It's it's almost half of the year. I mean, let's face it. Summer starts when uh, you know the warm weather starts, roughly uh, in April, something like that, and it will continue all the way through pretty much of October. But yet, it seems very short compared to those winter months. The winter months just go on and on and on and on. Do you agree with that, Art? Now, that's why it seems like an oval. To most people, the summer 
is like the back stretch, <laughs> or you might call it the front stretch. The winter is the back stretch, and spring and fall are comparatively short seasons. They just sort of are there. You know, fall is suddenly here and it's gone, then it's winter. Uh, spring is here and it's gone, and summer is here. So those are the turns. So a person often sees uh, the year is this big oval. See, he's running around this track, <laughs> you know, with all the other, uh, all of mankind. It's like a gigantic race. Thousands of them are pounding along, and they're pounding along this track. Some of them are, you know, falling by the wayside. Uh, others are going, uh, struggling their way. Others are doing it uh, reluctantly. Uh, still others are running like crazy up in the front, you know, with, with flags flying and birds whistling over their heads. They're running along there. And, and the whole, all of mankind, you, how many people are alive in the world today? Well, it's in the excess of two billion. This is WOR New York. And all of them are running against the same clock. Nobody, if you lived in India, it doesn't matter. If you live in Greenland, it doesn't matter. It has a certain finite time on Earth, and the Earth... Is, 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 is way beyond his control. You know, the sun is moving around and the galaxies and the earth is spinning around in the, you know, among the planets and all. And, and, and there's just nothing you can do to change it. And it's happening to everybody. No way it can be different. You could be as, you know, as rich as you want. It still is not going to affect the orbit of the earth. I mean, you cannot say, hey, right, Charlie, for God's sakes, do you know last year went uh, at least twice as fast as it should? Let's slow it up next year. I don't care what it costs. No way. <laughs> and so, so everybody's riding this enormous, uh, this unbelievable, uh, uh, complex, uh, unimaginable thing. Time, space, uh, deep space, the curving of time. These are all, you know, the, the concepts that Einstein dealt with. Most people just don't think about this. They just keep walking around. You ask him about it. Hey, so what are you talking about? Ain't nothing dumb. He says, what do you, you want to talk about time? I'll tell you what about time. It's 6.05. You say, oh, come on, what the hell does 605 mean? What do you mean? We're right here. I got my tray mix. 605. So, wait a minute. Has it ever occurred to you that this is an abstract concept? Six watts. Oh, five watts. What? Wow, six hours? Uh, that means uh, six o'clock. What kind of stoop are you? Well, the basic slob does not see anything. Archie Bunker sees nothing complex in anything. There's no, nothing complex uh, in anything at all. And, and he even deals with death in very uncomplex terms. So, so uh, well, you ask him about death. He says, "Well, I'll tell you about death." He says, uh, uh, "When you gotta go, you gotta go." So, the answer to that. When your numbers up, your numbers up. All uh, right, that's <laughs> he's dealt with all eternities. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, before we go, time. Now you take out our time. When you're listening to a great story and a guy's telling you a fantastic story, time goes almost instantly. When you're listening to a commercial, it seems to go on for three or four weeks. Just across the causeway from Miami, there's an island so beautiful, we call it the Caribbean Island in Florida. Its name, Key Biscayne. And on this island is a very special resort. The Sheridan Royal Biscayne Beach Hotel and Racquet Club. On a dazzling white beach, surrounded by crystal blue waters. Here, you'll find luxurious rooms, private terraces, and ocean views. Continental cuisine served in elegant restaurants. Ten tennis courts, four lighted for night play, two swimming pools, and a superb 18-hole championship golf course just to drive away. A vacation at the Royal Biscayne is a refreshing experience on a delightfully informal island with all the excitement of Miami Beach nearby. Your travel agent can help you plan a Royal Biscayne hotel vacation on Key Biscayne. Or call us toll-free at 800-325-3535 for reservations and information. That's 800-325-3535. Uh, let's see, a couple more biggies here. Uh, hmm, at Buddy's Place, September 2nd through the 6th, Buddy Rich presents Buddy Greco, uh, plus comedian Mike Preminger. And according to the copy here, Buddy's Place is the place to see and hear top performers and the best jazz in town. And it's on 133 West 33rd Street, fashionable neighborhood. So catch the act at Buddy's Place. Uh, the number to call is 736-2888 for reservations, and they accept most major credit cards. Oh, uh, 
are you interested in vitamins containing natural source ingredients? <laughs> there is a broad line of squib vitamins containing these natural source ingredients called Golden Bounty, like cornucopia, now available in your area. The uh, squib name is important when you buy vitamins because you want a name that you can trust. Probably even more trusty than your name. Squib has marketed vitamin products since 1875, so they know how to do it, you know. So you make an investment in confidence when you buy Squib vitamins. It's available at your neighborhood pharmacy in New York, northern New Jersey, Long Island, Westchester, southern Connecticut, lower Slobovia, everywhere. Don't forget to tune in to this weekend's Jets football game. It will be a ding-dong, sponsored in part by your local Squib Theragran pharmacist. It's Labor Day. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, to, to carry on the story of Labor Day, we've got to get right back at it. That, uh, <laughs> you, you see the world as, as, a, as, a, as some kind of a big track you're running on. How do you see mankind? Do you see mankind as an enormous crowd and you're there jostling in the middle of it? Or do you see mankind as some concept, some gray thing off in the distance and there's just you sitting up there? How do you see it? Did you consider yourself part of mankind, Art? Well, there has been that doubt around here, too, among others, I right, about you. I, I must say that uh, you're a man of unbelievable uh, honesty about yourself. Most of us do not have that kind of honesty. But nevertheless, uh, you, we see the year, you know, and, and at this, this kind of oval. Well, here's what makes this type, this holiday, this particular holiday, a depressing one. You know that they find that the people, two holidays, cause two opposing emotions. The highest number of suicides in, in the Western world, generally, because we're the only ones that celebrate New Year's and Christmas at that particular time, comes around New Year's and Christmas. Did you know that, Art? It's a tremendous amount of suicide because uh, they, uh, there's a lot of theories about it. One, uh, you know, one of the, uh, all kinds of theories on why, but one of the most prevalent theories is that, that suddenly a guy arrives at this time of year. It's New Year's. It's another year. And he's, he's suddenly very conscious of the fact that the time is going by. He feels like he's not doing anything. His whole life is, is dissolving. What the hell? Whatever happened in 1968? It was just 68! What is it mean? What is it? 75! What the hell is this? You know? And he begins to, he begins to feel like he's, he's clinging to a cliff that's crumbling. And, and, and he, he slides up and down and backwards, and he winds up putting a shot in his head. Many do. Not all, of course. <laughs> but uh, but the, the, there is an upsurge of suicides. Now, what does this time of the year do? Curious thing about this time of the year. That, that, that there's two conflicting emotions about uh, Labor Day right at this point. There is a sense that summer is over. It's over, over. It may be 100 degrees next week, but we still say, do you remember last summer? Oh, wow. For some reason or other, people stopped going to the beach on Labor Day. Now, it's going to be warm for at least six weeks, or it's going to be warm for a couple of months. I mean, perfect weather for going to the beach, and yet the beaches will be deserted the day after Labor Day. Why? Psychological. Summer's over. What do you expect me to do? Go to the beach away, you crazy? Then it's 107 degrees, the guy's walking around sweating like a pig, and you know, so he won't, it, it's psychological, he figures summer's over and winter is here, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, he's just sitting there waiting for winter to start. Now the two conflicting emotions that hit a guy are these, and you probably experienced them, one, regret, oh god, oh what do you mean, summer just started! I never even got to the beach once. What the hell is this? Mabel, next summer, we're not going to boot it again like we did this year. All right. In other words, summer is gone, and there's a regret that it's gone. But there is also a curious, irrational feeling of renewal. That as, you, the, you know, it's like a new year, has, a new school year. It goes back to school. Uh, a lot of things, you know, when you were going to school, yeah, uh, immediately following Labor Day, almost all of us went back to school. And it was a traditional time to go back to school. A new grade, a new teacher, a whole new ball game. You know, I'm going to wipe the slate clean. I mean, boy, I really lost up in 5B. You know, 
<laughs> I mean, it's 5A now, a whole new slate. And I'm starting out. I haven't even plucked nothing yet. And, uh, you know, you go in there, it's like the, the opening day of the ball season. All ball clubs are equal. Three outs later, they start to separate them. <laughs> I mean, you know, the season's already going downhill for many a club. And that's the way with many a kid. All right. So you start out with this irrational belief that this year it's going to be different. Oh, boy, I'm going to do I wonder how many guys figure it's fall now. It's fall. And I'm going to... I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to actually write that novel this summer, this fall, this fall. I'm going to get that, and I'm going to, I'm going to do all these great things. I'm going to paint, you know, he's got all these great ideas. Now, by New Year's, he knows it ain't going to happen. <laughs> and if anything, it's worse than last year. So, there you go. Now, uh, here it is, Labor Day. Well, now, there's a lot of conflicting memories. I don't know whether you have any memories at all of Labor Days, but I want to tell you this. One of the, one of the most fantastic memories I have out of my childhood day involved a company picnic. It was <laughs> traditional. My old man, he was always working at a place called, euphemistically, the office. <laughs> he was always at the office. The Java father was always going to the office. And, and, uh, and you'd hear about this when you're a little kid. You know, you're in the kitchen there, sitting around at the kitchen table, and the old man would be talking about the office. And it gets sort of a mystical quality of you know, the office. And uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's the, it's the official world of the adult. He goes to the office. And at the office, these very important things happened all the time. And there were these people that always played a role in the stories about the office. You never saw these people. And and uh, it, it, unless it was at the Christmas party, once the Great White, you'd get a fleeting glimpse of Mr. Gallagher or uh, Mr. Bullard. And uh, the old man had these enemies, these various enemies that were at the office. He also had various good guys that were at the office and he would talk about. It. And so, you know, he'd sit at the kitchen table. And I remember sitting there, and my my old, you know, my mother's hanging over the sink, you know, and she's uh, wearing her bathrobe, and she's got the water running, and she's got the meatloaf on, and it's supper time. The old man's in a bad mood, and he says, "Oh, oh, I'm going to get out of that rat race. I got to get out of that damn office. It's driving me up the wall. If I've got to listen to that idiot Sherby once again, that guy comes to. You should have read the memo that I got today from Sherby." Well, he's talking about the mystic Sherby all the time. Now, I, you know, I'm six or something like that, saying I keep hearing about Sherby. And he he was constantly rotten. See, Sherby was rotten all the time in the in the stories. On the other hand, he would say, oh, you know, that Zudok really kills me. He's the funniest guy, I'll tell you. Zudok come in the other day, and Zudok sat down, and what do you think he had with him? <laughs> Zudok brought in a couple of cantaloupes in the office today, and what do you think he had the cantaloupes? He had put a little hole in the cantaloupe, and he filled the cantaloupes up with bourbon. And we sat there, you know, he's got this whole story about Zudok. Zudok was a good guy, and Zudok was always doing these great things, but Sherby was evil. Well, the year goes by, two years go by, and I'm growing up. You know, I'm now no longer five. I moved through the year of six. Now I'm seven, and I'm beginning... Do you ever go through the period when you worry about your parents? I mean, you figure your mother's never going to live past the time when you're ten. She's going to die. And uh, you figure you, know, you figure your father's going to die, you know, and everybody's going to die. And there's going to be poor little you struggling through. And on top of that, you also have a conflicting emotion that you're going to die. That you're, you're never going to... You're never going to make 21. You had that, didn't you, Art? And if you did, you'd probably be blind. And then they'd be sorry, right? I mean, for all the rotten stuff they did. Well, here I am, you know, I'm about seven, see. <laughs> and it's the end of summer. And the office, which meant about 17 million guys, because this was a major company the old man worked for, they're having a company picnic. And it's being held at the forest preserves. So we drive out there, you know, the old man's got on his... He's got on his sports shirt instead of his usual tie, and you know, we're driving out of the sports shirt. And my mother's got a, hal a halter. I think, didn't women wear a thing called a halter? Have you ever heard of a halter? 
Uh, she's got on a halter. That played a role later when she got this unbelievable sunburn because of her halter. And me and my kid brother sit in the back seat, so we drive out to this this place. It was up out in the, out the country. It was it was called a, a forest preserve. And uh, they had a PA system. I can remember they had these big poles with big speakers on the top there. And the PA system was playing music all the time. Like, uh, 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 and it was mostly patriotic type music. Like they played the Colonel Bogey March. And uh, thousands and thousands of guys from the office or, or the plant. But the office had its own little thing going. See, the, there were two groups of guys. There were guys from what my old man called the plant. Those were mysterious guys he had very little to do with except that they were all universally idiots. We refer to them as, oh, those idiots in the plant. What do you expect? A guy works in a plant. Well, there were guys in the plant, and then there were guys in the office, which were composed of two groups, good guys and bad guys. You got it, right? See, there were the Sherbys, and there were the Zudoks. Now, as a kid, I hadn't seen any of these people <laughs> the first time. See? So there's thousands and thousands of people all out there, and they had tremendous long tables where they had big tubs of hot dogs, which everybody got free there, see. Hot dogs, mustard rolls. They had great big uh, wash tubs full of ice, which uh, had in it uh, knee-high orange and Coke and Pop and Pepsi and all that stuff, root beer. And, of course, all the men were drinking this beer. They, they, they had beer for the men. See, they're all walking around drinking beer. Well, you know what beer does on a hot day. Especially when it's free and guys are getting maybe 30 or 40 of them an hour. Well, brief moments of excitement would break out. And they had contests for us kids like uh, the sack race. Uh, <laughs> you know what a sack race is. You know, when you two kids get in and you put your foot in there. If there's anything I hate, it's a non-competitor getting tied up with a competitor. Now, I want to win when I do things. And there I am out there. Oh, I don't even want to talk about it. It still makes me mad. That when the gun went off, there I am with the sack. I got my right my right foot in the sack, and this other kid. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what it was. There was a kid named Arvid Anderson. Arvid Anderson's got his left foot in the sack, and his father worked at the office, right? I just heard of Anderson once in a while. And uh, the, my mother says, go ahead. You go ahead and race with Arvid. Poor Arvid. Nobody's asking Arvid to race. So... I want to win. And boom, the gun goes, and Arvid starts to giggle. He falls down. I'm dragging this slob all the way through the course with him, like, ha, ah, he's laying there. I want to win, you know, and I see these other kids going ahead. And what do you think they got? I mean, gee whiz, wow. Oh, I don't even talk about it. You know, I just skunked in a sack race. And so I came back to the to the hamburger joint. I'm getting a hamburger, and I'm eating a, eating a you know, I'm eating a, hamburger and I'm drinking Pepsi Cola and stuff. My kid brother's milling around. The heat is going up. And the old man comes over and he says, come on. He takes my mother. He says, come on. I want you to meet some of the boys in the office. Oh, God. I don't ever forget what I did. Did you ever do something in, in your lifetime as a kid that remained a family legend and, in fact, almost a family disaster? Not you, David. I know you never did any of that stuff. He comes from a well or very well, well ordered Princeton life. They don't do that kind of stuff. But I can tell Art. Art's glasses are clouding up when he remembers what he did. Well, we were. <laughs> oh, listen. This was almost as bad as later when my old man found my my uh, supply of pornographic literature down in the basement in the coal bin, hid under the tires. Listen, that was something else. I'll tell you that story sometime when the kids are in bed. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> here we are. The old man's taking us as crowds of people, thousands of people, all kinds of kids and maybe ladies and men. They had the, the, the married men versus the, the, the single men softball team, the fat men versus the skinny men. They had the plant versus the office ball team. And now we are walking along a big table. I can see it in my mind. And the old man's taking my mother, and he says, I want you to meet there. Hey, Zudok, come on over here. Hey, hey. He says to my mother, hey, this is Zudok. You remember to talk about Zudok, and there's old fat Zudok. <laughs> he says, hey, listen. And he's, hey, did I tell you about the hot foot I just gave Bullard? You know, he's going on that. But, you know, Zudok was great. And I looked at Zudok. He was kind of a great guy, see, because for years I'd heard about what a great guy Zudok was. Well, we move on, and all of a sudden the old man says, oh, I say, uh, hey, Mr. Sherby, Sherby, come on over here. I want you to meet my wife. 
And this tall, skinny guy with a red face comes over. And he says, oh, well, hello there. And he takes my mother's hand. He shakes her hand. I don't know why I did it. Here I am, seven. I says, are you Sherby? He says, why, yes, little boy. I, my name is Mr. Sherby. Why are you so rotten to my father at the office? He always comes home and says that you're, you're rotten. And not only that, he says you're stupid. Would you please bring a little martial music on? And the PA system play. I just remember my father's face was absolutely ashen, snow white. It wasn't until years later I learned that Mr. Sherby was the manager of the office. I had just told Sherby that my old man came home and said he was a stupid bum and an idiot and constantly was making these dumb moves. Out of the mouth of babes shall come indeed the truth. And the old man turns and goes, ha, 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 the church says, yes, uh, he is a very funny kid. Uh, well, uh, good to see you, Shepard. Uh, see you around. Uh, see you around. And he walks off. He was the only guy at the Christmas party later on. We just sat in the corner and wore a black suit. During the entire during the entire picnic, he wore a black suit. He always wore a black suit. I don't want to tell you what happened the rest of the day. The old man grabs my hand, yanks me down. Will you shut up? What the hell do you think you're doing? What do you think you're talking to? That was Sherby. He turns to my mother. He says, I told you we ought to leave these kids home. I said, that night, we rode home in silence from the Labor Day picnic. And ever since that time, whenever I hear bands playing in a distance, people tell me that it's Labor Day. I remember that sinking sensation of riding home in the Oldsmobile. The old man saying, wait till I get you home. Wait till I get you home. Thank you, I told it, told it, told it. I still remember the old man's ashen face when he turned. <laughs> He's just a funny kid. He says funny things. <laughs> Sherby didn't say anything. That red face, that black suit. There are certain kinds of people, you know, that make no concession to the climate nor the seasons. There are people who wear gray serge suits winter and summer and a felt hat on the top of the head. You see him in the elevator here. You see those guys? That's right. Winter, summer, doesn't make any difference. They take no cognizance of the spinning sun, the moving firmament, and the orbit of the Earth around. Oh, God, who knows how far it'll go. And now we're galloping into that short turn, the fall, and then that long back stretch, the winter. Happy, happy, happy.